Okay, this is going to be the second part. This is going to be the second part of my presentation on the adventures of a common law free man. So, the first thing about common law is if you don't serve notice on somebody, you don't get any play. That's the way it works. You have to let somebody know how you feel. And if they don't um, say that what you're stating is incorrect and wrong, then failure to deny is to admit. It is a known duty and obligation of each man to defend their rights. So if the government wants to defend its rights to do something to you, it's going to have to speak up. Acquiescence and latches are cognate but not equivalent terms. The former is a submission to or resting satisfied with. In other words, if I call you a murderer and you don't say no, that you didn't do it, then you must be okay with it. An existing state of things. While latches implies a neglect to do that which the party ought to do for his own benefit or protection. But the first thing you have to do is actually give them a notice. And so, you know, Rob Menard started it, um, probably many people have done it before that, with his idea of putting in a claim of rights. Right? Serving them notice that you are making a claim. I call my claim of rights a declaration of status slash requirement to perform. Because that's what it is. Declaration of status slash requirement to perform. And in my declaration of status, I'm going to say who I am and who I'm not. And my page is pretty long and it has my picture on it and it has my thumbprint on it and it has my address for service of process on it, and it has an expiration date on it, and it was a sworn statement that was notarized as a jurat. Acquiescence to the facts as being true 30 days afterwards. Then my third party who has mailed all these um, pages out, you know, and you always keep the original. You never send the original out. You always keep the original and you state on the copy that this is, I certify this is a true and correct copy of the original. You initial it. It's got your little blue ink initial on there. So obviously it must be true. Or at least somebody can't come up and say, hey, you know, that never happened. No, nope, that's my initial. I put it there you got a copy of it. You know, you got a, a true and correct copy with my initial on it. And you're going to have the original copy of the default that you signed that you're going to make copies of. All of the letters probably should be sent out registered mail and with a green card return. And then you can ask the governor to send you a certified copy of the letter that you sent him showing that he actually received it. It's a maxim of law that failure to deny is to admit an unrebutted affidavit goes as truth. And so the facts are established by testimony in court and an affidavit is a prima facie case that there's a fact that's true. Prima facie is that it looks okay on the surface. There's something there. We're not saying it's true, but, it, but we know that there's something there, right? The next thing I do is I create a little one-page notice to abate whatever issue somebody is sending me. They're sending, you know, you're always getting some kind of claim from government, right? Either it's a taxing authority or something. They're sending you some kind of claim. So I always just return the claims with a Derimer notice of mistake because it's never sent to me, it's always sent to the straw man, right? The all capital version of my name. The name that I'm known as, because I'm not a name, right? If I'm Andy Jackson, I am not Andy Jackson. I'm known by Andy Jackson. Is this, is this you? You know, the officer holds the driver's license up. Is this you? Um, no, I'm a man, that's a piece of plastic. That's not me. Say, how could it be you? It's not you. It's not the man. And if you're looking at me while you're saying it, if you're, unless you're completely incompetent, you should recognize the difference between the party that you're addressing as a man and a piece of plastic in your hand. It's not you. Is it your driver's license? Nope. It was created by the men and women at the DMV. I didn't create it. 
I don't want ha I don't want anything to do with it. And if you want to enforce your rights under the driver's license a little easier, but you still don't want to go so far as to not have a driver's license anymore, just sign on the on the signature line, um, you know, without prejudice or all rights reserved or you know under protest. Anything that indicates that you're not agreeing to it, you know. You can sign by, colon, your scribbled initials, that's your signature, well, at least, you know, works for me. You won't find a judge who signs their name. On their oath of office, it's all perfect, like they were in grade school and the teacher told them, good job, Johnny, you signed your name and it's legible. Every single order they ever issue will be this little mm, scribble that is not legible. You can't read the person's name from the scribble. And if there's a reason for that, they don't want anybody to be able to read that. So the next thing would be um, most of the issues you're going to have, um, so, some government agent is going to send you a letter, right? You owe property taxes, you owe this, you owe that, you owe whatever it is. You know, if it's not a big deal, then why bother contesting it? You know, aren't you going to pay your water bill? <clears throat> you're going to, you know, pay your PG&E bill. You know, you can send letters to all of those agencies and just tell them, you know, change of name and address, and I need you to address me correctly, and then send it certified to them. And of course, they're never going to change it, but at least you're going to have a record of your demand that they change it. Change my name to the correct spelling and the correct post location because I don't live in a state that's called CA on the capital letters. That's not a state, right? California is a state, and I always put the, the time that the state was first accepted into the Union, um, and, you know, technically if it's before the Civil War, then, you know, that's when you want to put it in. If your state was accepted before the Civil War, you want to include that time of its acceptance in, because the states were independent of the federal government prior to the Civil War. The Constitution that was created after the Civil War in every single state is a, not a Constitution that's valid. No Constitution is valid unless you agree to it. <laughs> that's just the fact of life. You have to agree to it. And since you know, you're not a signatory on the Constitution and you never agreed to the Constitution in being able to be enforced upon you, then why not dispute that fact? So you take a presentment sent from the government agent to you and I just make a photocopy of the original and send it back to them with a notice of mistake. You know, this is a mistake. Obviously you weren't talking to me because my name and post location are not correct here. And in addition, I'm going to send along my notice to abate, which is just going to state that, you know, uh, the government's fictional, a fictional party, and no fictional party can impose its will upon me. I'm not the party that's named in the, on the document, right? I'm not the party in all capital letters. That's a franchisee that is a creation of the government. You didn't create it, so who created it? Not you, not your parents. And you have a right to call yourself whatever you want. You have a common law right to have your name be whatever you want it to be. So if they're going to take your name and unlawfully convert it to something else, that's trespassing on your rights. And it's certainly, they can call it whatever they want, but don't expect me to answer to that. That's not me. So. The next thing we're going to discuss is, you know, we send the letters back and that kind of like deals with that, do a proof of service. And then if they want to come back later and said you didn't uh, pay what you owed, no, I sent you a letter back demanding that you abate the matter or show cause. Do you had, did you have any actual factual evidence that I'm liable for that claim you made? Who's making the claim? I don't understand. There's no signature on it. There's no man or woman making the claim. So. Things that aren't men and women, you know, fictional entities don't have any rights to make claims upon me, right? California State Franchise Tax Board, I'm sorry, is that a fictional thing or is that a man? 
And if it, you know, if its job is to regulate franchise taxes, here's the definition in Black's Law of a franchise tax is a tax on a corporation. Well, I'm not a corporation. I know I never applied to be a corporation. So you can take your franchise tax board and deal with corporations, but you can't deal with me. You have no right there. So the next issue that you're going to come up with where there's going to be a dispute over your rights is going to be court, right? We go to court, courts where you settle disputes. So the process of going to court starts legitimately with administrative remedy. You're going to send somebody a notice that they owe you money, that they haven't paid on their contract that you have with them, or whatever it is, there's a dispute and I'm letting you know. If you don't let them know, how are they going to know? If they come to court and said, well, he never told me that I owed him money, the court's going to look at you like, why are you taking up our precious time when you could have just sent him a letter? And what are you going to answer to that? So the first thing that starts is you send somebody a notice, you know, you owe me money. And then you don't pay, I send a notice of default that you defaulted on my notice that you owe me money and you refuse to either show cause that I have a liability to you and because you fail to show cause then your claim that I owe you money is an attempt at extortion basically. I mean if you don't have any reason for collecting money from me and you can't prove that I'm liable and you go ahead and try anyway after I've demanded that you prove it, you know, you're violating the law. I don't have a debt to you, right? So let's call, you know, let's call it what it is. Anytime somebody says you owe money, it must be a debt. And if we, you know, I can claim that the federal laws and the state laws don't apply to me, but I know damn well they apply to people that are agents of that business. If you go to work at Walmart, aren't you subject to the rules of Walmart? So if you're an agent of government, you're subject to the rules of government. Under the rule 15... USC 1692, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act, once I challenge the authority of the debt collector, the debt collector has to verify the debt. That means they have to swear under penalty of perjury that you owe money and they have to say the exact amount you owe and they never will. They never do. So, see, it's just more evidence that the law really doesn't apply to anybody because if it, if it doesn't apply to the employee, if the employer's handbook doesn't apply to the employee, who does it apply to? So you go into court and you have administrative remedy to get in there. Let's say you are going to sue them or they are going to sue you, whatever. There has to be some kind of notice that there should be administrative remedy first. They're going to require it of you if you're going in to sue somebody else. But when the state sues you, they don't require that. So then you go in and in court, gate number one that you have to go through is nobody can sue somebody in court unless they have standing to sue. If you don't have standing to sue, you don't have any business being there. And the Supreme Court has ruled that standing is a personal injury or loss. Well, this is where we get back to fictions again. How can something that's fictional, that there's no evidence that they're real, have a personal injury or a loss? Imaginary things can't lose anything. There's nothing to lose. So there has to, there has to be standing to sue. And in a criminal case, it's corpus delecti, which amazingly is, amazingly is the exact same thing, personal injury or loss. So. Do you have those things? Who was personally injured? The people of the state of California? I deny they exist. I don't believe they're real. Give me the name and address to serve the subpoena on them so that I can force them to come in court and testify. The next issue is you have to be a real party in interest to sue. I don't know, but you know my definition of real is something that I can perceive with my senses that everybody else agrees with me is real, right? We get five people, we all see the same man. We say, oh, he's so high and he's got such and such colored hair and we all take a picture of him, that's the man. We all agree we see him, he's real. 
But if you can't produce a man to stand in front of you, then he's not real. And, you know, rocks don't come to court and sue anybody. They just don't. I haven't seen a bird launch a lawsuit against a man in uh, forever. So the only people that come to court and sue are men and women, right? That's it. So what's real? A real party in interest. First of all, you have to show that you actually exist as a man or woman. And second of all, what's your interest? You know, what personal injury or loss are you complaining of? Because if I didn't do anything to you and I didn't harm you or wrong you in any way, trespass on any of your rights, like Hale versus Henkel says, I don't owe you a thing. I don't owe you anything. You have no interest. That's why I always put the definition, my definition, of real and interest on my abatement letter. And then when if they come back and say, well, no, no, we have a right to sue you. No, you have, a, you have a requirement to abate the matter or show cause that you are real and that you have an interest. You didn't do those things. So now you are in attempting a fraudulent, frivolous, meritless suit, claim. I wouldn't even call it a suit. Suit, action, claim. It's a claim. You're making a claim. Who's making the claim? What man is making the claim? Is it a requirement that a man make the claim? Well, under the real party and interest rule, yeah, it is a requirement. And if it's not a real party and interest, then a real party and interest has to be joined to the act. If you want to sue in the name of the people of the state of California, you're going to have to add Bob McGee <laughs> because he's the guy that you stole from or he's the guy that you hit over the head with a sh shovel. He's the guy that was harmed and injured. It's not that hard, is it? I mean, can you join a real party and interest as a plaintiff? Who's the claimant? And I don't like using bar association terms, so I'm not going to call the plaintiff the party doing the suing. I'm going to call him the claimant because if you're not making a claim, then it's, you don't have any right to go to court. So gate number one, to get in the gate and actually have the court even consider your case, you have to present it and you have to show you have jurisdiction to proceed. So you have to show standing, you have to show you're a real party in interest, you can't be suing as a fictitious plaintiff. The plaintiff's not real, <laughs> fictitious. So now we get to gate two. The dispute. The dispute is going to outline facts and law because that, that's the only thing that counts in a court case. No matter what else you think counts, nothing else counts. It's only facts and law. Facts and law. And the only reason to go to court is if there is a dispute over what the facts and law are. That's what the purpose of court is, to settle those disputes. If there's no dispute over the facts, then you don't need a jury to be the trier of facts and declare what the facts are. You don't need that. You admit it to it. So if there's any stipulation and admitting to the facts, then that's a fact that doesn't need to be disputed anymore. I said in my claim that the facts are I was kidnapped. You didn't dispute the fact that I was kidnapped and you went on and on about the law says you have the right to do that. Nope, you have to dispute that fact that I was kidnapped. So all I have to do is show the required elements that make kidnapping a kidnapping, right? You took my body from one point to another against my will. Okay, I was kidnapped. Are you claiming you didn't do that? No, you did it. The only thing that would give you the right to do it would be if it was a valid arrest. If I claim that there was a false arrest, then I'm mentioning the term arrest, and I'm making an allegation that the arrest was not valid. And then it's a dispute over whether it was valid or not. 
if I state that I was kidnapped, then you have to prove that I wasn't kidnapped, actually I was arrested. And in order to be arrested, then there has to be a warrant for my arrest, grand jury indictment, has to be probable cause determination made by a judge. So they have to take you into custody, then take you in front of a judge for a probable cause hearing who then issues a warrant. Otherwise, if you don't do all these things or some kind of judicial determination that there was exigent circumstances, you were running around in front of the, on the street shooting your gun off and it could have hurt somebody. You were you know, obviously a danger to other people. You don't have any evidence I was a danger to other people? You don't have any exigent circumstances. So there has to be a dispute over the facts. That's what a court is for, to determine what the facts are, what the law is, and whether somebody's guilty or not, right? It's about property rights, whose property, whose rights, and you're there to defend your rights, and the other man is there to defend his rights. If it's not about rights and property, then you don't really belong in court. And then you have, because your body's your property, so if you're gonna hit me, then you know, you've trespassed on my property, right? I have a black eye to prove it. So the dispute is going to be facts and law. Your claim is going to list facts and law, and the other party has to dispute those facts and law. The minute there's a dispute, we're going to trial. Gate three. Now, in common law, there is none of this gate three stuff. In common law, the claim has to list all the things that you're complaining about. The complaint, the claim has to tell who did what, when, where, why, how, you know, all of those things that any good story has to have to be complete, you put in your claim. And then you get to go in front of a jury and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and nobody gets any right to stop you from telling your truth to the jury. There's no interference in that. So gate three, if it's in common law, the claim is all you need. You go to jury, you go to trial. You have whatever evidence you have, you know. You can ask somebody else to produce something, but they don't have to. There's no obligation to give you any, give you any incriminating evidence like discovery would. Hey, I'm gonna put in a motion for discovery and I want you to testify against yourself by turning over documents. You don't have, you don't have that right to make them do that, right? If you can get a judge to issue a warrant to go search their house based on the fact that they committed a crime, okay. But if they didn't commit a crime, I don't know that you can force somebody to turn over their, their documents that they keep at home. Either you have evidence that you've been cheated or not. If you don't have it, you don't have any right to come to court. You have to suffer a loss, and the loss has to be attributable to the party that you're suing. Now, in regular court system, where they use code pleading, then gate three is motions and discovery. This is where your claim comes in and the other side is gonna get rid of your claim if they can. Motion you know, to dismiss for failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. What does that mean? Failure to state a claim upon which relief can be granted. Uh, would you like to be a little more specific Right. Well, you're suing for breach of contract, but you don't have a contract, so you don't have a claim. I mean, if your if your claim doesn't include a copy of the contract, then we can't give you anything. No jury can find you guilty if you're not going to show the contract because the contract makes the law. It's the law between the two parties that agreed to that contract if it's a valid contract. And if you don't have a copy of the contract, what are you here for? So then you put in all your motions and you do your discovery, which you can do requests and admissions, ask them to admit to certain things, interrogatories, where you ask them a question, you know, are you in possession of a license to practice law? Yes or no? <laughs> 
It's funny because, you know, I had a credit card case and the lawyer for the other side said, I am a duly licensed, not licensed, licensed attorney. So in the interrogatory, I said, Do you, are you in possession of a license from the state of California to practice law? He's, his reply to that was, the question was vague and ambiguous. Well, apparently he's incompetent to act as an attorney if he doesn't know the, the words that he's using on his, own com, on his own complaint. Because he signed the complaint, so he's the one making the claim. And if he doesn't know the definition and he thinks those terms are vague and ambiguous, then he's incompetent to use them in the first place. Throw the case out. It's a fraud. You're incompetent. Incompetent people can't come to court and make claims. If you're going to lie and commit fraud, fraud in one thing, fraud in everything. How do we know that you're not lying now? We proved that you were lying a minute ago. It's the way it works. So you got motions and discovery and basically this is where you try to seal the deal if you're using um, those things to, to prove that it if they don't produce something in discovery, they can't bring it up in court. That's the general rule. You list your witnesses and list all the documents you're going to be producing and your, any video that you're going to be producing, you have to show your cards to the other side. So if they're suing you in a criminal case or civil case and you demand all of the discovery that they're going to be presenting in court and they don't give it to you, then they can't bring any of it in. Bingo, boom. You don't have any witnesses. None of them are listed on the discovery request. You refuse to provide discovery. So, Number four, trial by jury. Gate number four, trial by jury. This is the proceedings have gotten past the discovery and the motions and now you're going to trial. Okay, what's going to happen at trial? Somebody's going to come up and testify. Unless a man gets on a witness stand that facts and law, the only two things that count at a trial, the facts and law, unless somebody gets up and swears in and testifies to the facts, no facts exist. Doesn't matter that there's pieces of paper or the attorney said this in court or you said that in court. If you say what you're saying from the table that you're sitting at, you that's that is going in one ear and out the other. It's not being recorded. It can't be considered a fact. The jury can't hear it. Of course, what are they going to do? Put their fingers in their ears and go, I didn't hear that. No, they heard it. But the point is, is that they can't consider that as a fact unless somebody swears in and testifies. Under oath. And then anybody that testifies under oath is presenting their side and the whoever put them on the stand is asking them questions, right? If you're prosecuting your own case, you get to go on the stand and swear in and testify to your um, information that you want the jury to hear, you know, tell your side of the story, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and the jury has to hear it. And now that you've testified to it, it can be a fact that be can be established by the jury. The other side, the opposition side, gets to cross-examine you. So your side does the examining and the other side does the cross-examining. And under cross-examination, they can ask you anything they want as long as it addresses those things that you testified to. If it exceeds that and, and you aren't their witness, then they can't ask you, you know, well, how much money did you make last year? I object. It's irrelevant. See? I'm not your witness, so you can only ask me about what I testified to, and you have to limit the scope of your cross-examination to what I testified to. What does that tell you? That if you're going to go in there and a policeman that arrested you is going to be a witness for the state, then you want to issue a subpoena for him so that he's your witness. At the point where he's your witness, you can ask him any questions you want. He's your witness. I'm sorry, sir. How long have you worked on the force? I don't know, 15 years. And um, would you have jurisdiction to perform this arrest if it happened in the state of Nevada? 
No. So you're saying you would only have jurisdiction and you could only lawfully arrest uh, me for this uh, violation of the penal code or whatever it is if it occurred in the state of California. Yes, that's true. Okay, describe what you mean when you say the term state of California. What is that to you? Immediately, the judge is going to step in and go, calls for a legal determination. No, he just said it. If he doesn't know what it means, then he's incompetent. And if he's incompetent, then you're going to have to strike all of his testimony from the record because he's incompetent to testify. He's using terms that he doesn't know what they mean. You see? You can ask him those questions if he's your witness, but you have to subpoena him as your witness. Is it going to look funny that you subpoena the cop? No. Why would it? He was there when you were arrested. <laughs> so he's your witness just as much as he's their witness. So you're at the trial by jury. You always want to testify. If you don't testify to what you, to the fact that you've complained that there's no jurisdiction in this matter and that you are not the defendant and whatever else you have as a reason for why you're not um, guilty here because you haven't harmed any man, there's no real party of interest. If you don't testify, then the jury can't hear it and no facts are entered into the record. Later, when you get a judgment against you and you and you're go to sentencing and you're sentenced to jail and you do your appeal, the appellate court is going to go, blah, 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 blah. We can only consider things that are in the record. We can only consider things that are in the record. You didn't testify, so there's no record. Well, doesn't it matter that they had no jurisdiction? You didn't t challenge the jurisdiction. I did in my writing but you didn't testify to that. They're not going to tell you. They are not going to help you understand what you need to do to make it so that you have made a record. But until you testify, you haven't made a record. This is also true. Robert Fox told me one time that he got a guy out of prison simply for stating that they had a court case the judge ruled that he was guilty, sentenced him to five years in jail or whatever. And Robert asked him, he goes, so did they have any witnesses testify? Nope. So nobody testified? Nope. Okay, so there's no facts established. And you can't be found guilty unless there's a determination of facts and law. The judge has no right to determine the facts and law. And there's no facts that he can make a determination on because there was no testimony. There's no facts that a judge could make a determination on because there's no testimony. Only testimony establishes facts. The guy walked out of jail the next day. You wouldn't call a corporation a person, but it is according to the law. But the man on the street wouldn't, wouldn't say something that's imaginary is a person. See the person standing next to me? See him? No, how could you? He's non-existent. Fictions aren't persons. So, when you look at the definitions for person, it's almost all fictions. I mean, how many times have you seen a limited liability company, which is a fictional thing, drive a car? A corporation, yeah, lots of corporations drive cars. <laughs> the only thing there could possibly be referring to in there that would be a man would be a natural person. But if everything in there is a fictional thing, then everything is a fictional thing. You can't, you know, intersperse fictional things with real things. Natural means real. It occurs in nature. And if you substitute the word corporation for person because a person can be a corporation or any of the other terms for the word person and natural person, then you have a natural firm, a natural co-partnership, a natural association, a natural limited liability company, or a natural corporation. And that's an oxymoron because there can't be something that's a real unreal. If you're talking about six things and five of them are obviously fictions, they're all fictions. It's kind of the rules of construction. If you're talking about um, horses, sheep, 
goats, pigs, chickens. What are we talking about? Farm animals. Do you include porpoise in there? You know, that's a fish. It doesn't occur on a farm. It doesn't belong. So the rules of construction is if they're all fictions, then you're talking about fictions. So you're not a person, you're a man. Stick with I'm a man. One of the people. Why one of the people? The people are sovereign. You have dozens of court cases that say that. I'm, I'm a man, one of the people of, you know, or not even of, on the land known as California 1849. Boom. You know, I'm not, I don't live in the city of Sacramento. Um, the city of Sacramento is a municipal corporation. I mean, you're looking at me, I'm a man. Men don't live in corporations. There's no other definition for the city of Sacramento than a corporation. You can talk about the land known as Sacramento, but that doesn't mean that Sacramento County is the land. How do I know this? Did the land pass any acts? I don't know. When did the land come into session and vote on some acts? So the land is not the county, it's not the city, can't be. And it's only something that we can use to describe an area. You cannot be in the city of Sacramento. It's an impossibility if you're real. Now, if you're a fictional thing, if you're that all capital letter name, who's a franchisee, a creation of an agent of the government, because they're the ones that created it. Ask them to change your name and post location and see what they come up with. My computer won't let me do that. Well, then get a new computer, babe, because guess what? You're unlawfully converting my name and you're trespassing on my name. So cease and assist sending letters to me. If you're trying to address me, the man, cease and desist sending letters to something that I'm not, because I'm going to return every one of them and I'm going to charge you a fee for every one I have to return. You know, you've had your court case. The jury's going to come up with you've been found guilty. They never just throw you in jail immediately unless you were actually in jail to begin with and you're there, you know, being held on bail or something like that. Usually you're free to go and you have to come back for sentencing where the judge tells you what your sentence is going to be. And it can be 90 days after the court case. Why do they give you 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? Why do they give you all that time? Because, you know, you have a right to dispute it, right? So before sentencing, after the jury trial, before sentencing, you have a right to do allocution. Look it up, do the research, find out what your rights on allocution are. You have a right to do allocution. In allocution, you get to show that the case is void because there was no jurisdiction, you're not the defendant, whatever. All of the reasons that you've listed, the court isn't a court of record, it's proceeding according to legislative act, and you don't consent to it. Just because you showed up, you showed up under threat and duress because they extorted money from you for bail. Whatever the reasons are to make the um, declaration invalid, right? You put it all down in your allocution. You're going to swear yourself in, read the letter that you put in an allocution, and actually type it up as a written um, piece of paper and turn it into the court and get them to give you a file stamped version, right? You need a file stamped version of the allocution that you put in. And the best thing to do is serve it, you know, by mail prior to the sentencing hearing. Now you got proof that, uh, you know, that your allocution was done. They can do whatever they want, but at least if you go for appeal, you got your evidence that you made these claims. Like I said before, the appellate court, the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court of the United States, none of them can hear anything unless they can see the record. So if they're not, if they don't have a transcriber recording every word that gets said in court, they have nothing to rely on 
and the only thing they have is your sworn testimony. So when you swear in and testify, they have to be recording that. That's recorded. You get copies of the transcripts. The next thing you can do is avoid judgment. Uh, Richard Cornforth did a whole bunch of work on void judgments. Void judgments are, you know, it's like a void law. Any law is void unless it comports to the requirements of the Constitution. Remember, the Constitution is one of delegated authority, so either they have the authority to do it, that can they change it? Can they start enforcing admiralty on the land? No, because admiralty meant on the sea. And there's plenty of court cases right after the Constitution was signed that outline that. How did that change to be allowing it to be applied on the land? It's an impossibility. We applied it on the land because we said we could. Well, the Constitution didn't allow for that. It allows you to apply admiralty, but when they said admiralty, this is what they meant. Because these court cases at the time define it as acts at sea. You decided to change those from acts at sea to include or to add acts on land. But you don't have any authority to change it. You want to go in and have a um, constitutional amendment that changes the meaning of the term? Knock yourself out. But until you do, you don't get to redefine things according to what you want. They have to be defined as what they meant at the time. So you can write a void judgment. Any law that is contradictory to the Constitution is void. It's as if it was never passed, has no effect. So the same is true with a court case. If a court case goes on and it's a void court case because there's no jurisdiction, there's no injured party, there's no evidence that you harmed anybody, then it's a void court case. You have to write a void judgment in. Most, you know, demand to vacate a void judgment. You send it to the appellate court. Let them rule on it. You can, sue, you can do an appeal and a void judgment. With an appeal, you're begging for them to change it. With a void judgment, you're ordering them to change it. But anyway, I hope this has been helpful and you know, good luck with your learning who you are, what your rights are, and how to proceed in this world of insanity. Thank you.